Vamos tentar manter a ordem aqui, tudo bem? Pessoal, muito obrigado. This is not a very big room, and I don't really believe in microphones. <laughs> I want to talk about two things tonight. I want to talk about technologies that might revolutionize the world in your lifetime. Uh, I am not making any prophecies. Uh, I don't know which of them are going to happen. But I believe that the future is much more uncertain than most people believe, assume that most people are much too conservative in assuming that 40 or 50 or 100 years from now the world will be just about the way it is now with a few minor changes. And I think that's very, very unlikely. So I want to talk first about various technologies that might change the world drastically and about how each revolution would affect us and how we might want to deal with it. Uh, this is the short version of my book, Future Imperfect. Uh, as you can see, that is my web page. You can see the URL at the top. And the web page has on it links to about half a dozen of my books, the full text of them. And right there is the link, if I can figure out how this silly Windows machine works. Uh, <laughs> there we go. To Future Imperfect, which as you can see, uh, I guess, no, that's, that's the published version. And there's another link, which I'm not going to find, but it's on the web page, which would take you to the uh, web version. And the web version you could read for free, along with about five other books of mine that I put up that way. Uh, how does technology affect us? What a technology does is to change what we can do at what cost. Not only what I can do that I want to do, but also what you can do to me. Which is why technologies are not unambiguously good, which you might think they would be, although they often are. And let me give you some examples. In order for East Germany to keep track of everybody, they had to have about half the population watching the other half. We can do it much more cheaply now. Uh, there is an old American movie called The President's Analyst in which the, everybody almost is trying to get control of the president's psychoanalyst in order to influence the president. And it finally turns out that the villain behind all the other villains is the phone company. The phone company in the movie, by the way, has no human beings in it anymore. It is 100% uh, uh, machines. And there's a scene in which the president's analyst goes into a telephone booth on a lonely road and calls up a CIA agent who is his current ally. And when he tries to open the telephone booth door, it won't open. And down the road comes a pickup truck with some telephone booths on it and a crane. And it picks up the telephone booth he is in, puts it on the back of the pickup truck, picks up an empty telephone booth, and replaces the telephone booth, and drives off. 30 seconds later, a helicopter descends with the CIA agent and a Russian NKVD agent who is his current ally. And they look at this empty telephone booth where the person just called them. And the American CIA agent said, said it can't be. Every telephone in America bugged? And the Russian said, don't be absurd. Man, you think you're a Russia? <laughs> it can be. If you think about wiretapping, uh, governments listening to people's phone calls. The main limit on wiretapping in the past was not the difficulty of getting permission to do it. It was the fact that it was very expensive. Because in order to do wiretapping, someone has to listen to hundreds of hours of phone calls waiting for the two minutes that betray whatever you want to find out. We now have computer programs that turn speech into text. We have computer programs that can search text for keywords indicating whatever you want to spy on. And computers work very, very cheap. 
Uh, I worked out years ago, I think it may be in the book, a rough estimate of the hardware cost of enough dedicated machinery to tap every phone in America. And I think it was somewhere around a billion dollars. And most modern governments have a billion dollars to spare if they, if they want it. So that's an example of a way in which technology makes the world, from the standpoint of many of us, worse. I say many of us. Some people would say it's a good thing to have the government watching people to avoid terrorists. But I think, on the whole, that the government is, on average, more dangerous than the criminals. Uh, what's the solution? The solution, I think, is not strengthening the laws against wiretapping. That's very hard to do. The solution is end-to-end -end encryption. Using, just as the computer technology has made it easy to wiretap, it has also made it easy to have communications that can't be wiretapped. So that the right solution, and the one which to some extent the world is gradually moving towards, partly because of revelations of what the CIA had been doing, or NSA had been doing, uh, is a technology where when you speak into the phone, then what you say is immediately encrypted, transferred, decrypted at the other end. Now, I'll be talking more about encryption later because encryption is a very powerful technology whose power most people don't yet, yet appreciate. Uh, more generally, when a technological change produces a result you don't like, makes it harder to do something you want to do, like controlling wiretapping. The usual response is, we have to keep doing it. We have to just try harder. And that's usually the wrong response. The right response is to say, what is our objective? Is there a way of using this new technology to achieve that objective in a different way? Uh, let me give you uh, another uh, example. Uh, and that's what I would like to refer to as the death of copyright. All right, the objective of copyright law, of law saying that you are not free to copy my book without my permission, to copy my movie or my song without my permission, the objective of that is to give people an incentive to write books and compose songs and make movies. Uh, because if everybody can copy it, how will I make any money out of it? Uh, copyright law is becoming less and less enforceable because any, any intellectual property that exists in digital form can be copied very, very quickly and cheaply. You can copy uh, hundreds of dollars worth of software onto a CD that costs you a dollar or so. Uh, many, many people have the equipment to do that copying. I've got it, well, I don't have it here because there's no CD drive on this machine. But the machine over there probably could pirate things if it wanted to. Right. Uh, so, one response is to say, well, how can we keep enforcing copyright law? And I think that's the wrong response. Because if you try to imagine how you would have to change things so that given the easy copying and the easy distribution, you could still enforce copyright law, it would mean something like requiring all computers to be searchable at any time so that the owner of a copyright could check every hard drive in the world to make sure it had no copies of his intellectual property. And that's not really a, something that I think we want to do. The alternative approach is to try to find other ways of making in people's interest to produce intellectual property. Uh, one approach is technological protection, to try to find ways of producing things that can't be copied. And that's a very limited approach. You could imagine, and this is an idea people worked out some time ago, that I, put, I, I produce a song and I distribute it inside a sort of a software box, inside a computer program, such that if you want to listen to the song, you have to pay five cents online to me, and then I give you the key that lets you listen to the song once. That would be technological protection. The reason that can't work, and people see why, however good my, my technology is, that can't be workable, because all somebody has to do is pay me five cents once and play the song with a tape recorder running. It's now out of the protection and he can give copies to anybody. That's what's referred to in the literature as the analog hole, hole in the encryption. On the other hand, there is a subset of intellectual property for which it can work, and that is any intellectual property that is not fully revealed when it's used. So that, for example, 
as if any of you are lawyers or have studied law may know, there are very large databases of law cases called Lexis and Westlaw. And lawyers pay lots of money to have access to those databases. But that doesn't mean that they have a useful copy, because what they have is the answer to one question. All right, I can say, well, I'm involved with this legal issue. Tell me about the cases dealing with that. The, next, the guy in the next office over doesn't have the same question. Therefore, my answer is no use to you. So that's an example of a form of intellectual property that is not fully revealed in one use, and therefore can, if you're careful enough, be protected by making sure that people can't actually hack into your website, into your server, and get the I was thinking many, good many years ago about how you could get an equivalent of that for entertainment. And I tried to imagine a movie that somehow was different each time you looked at it, you got different camera angles and so forth. And after I've been thinking about this question for quite a while, I realized that I was already spending many hours a week consuming just such a product. It's called World of Warcraft. <laughs> if you think about a game like World of Warcraft, it's a piece of intellectual property. You can make a movie of your adventure in World of Warcraft, but nobody wants to see your adventure. They want to have their adventure. So that's an example of a form of intellectual property which can be technologically protected, as movies cannot be. And one conclusion I reached is that in the future, things like World of Warcraft will become more common relative to movies because it is more practical for the producer to charge for that than it is to charge for a movie. Right? We may come back to World of Warcraft later in a different context. Uh, another way, a fairly old way, in which you can get paid for intellectual property uh, even though you can't enforce copyright law is to give away the intellectual property and sell something connected to it. So that, for example, when the Macintosh computer first came out, it included a word processor, which was a pretty new idea then, called McWrite, and a painting program called McPaint. They were both free. There was nothing to keep me from making copies of McWrite to anybody who wanted them. But of course, they were of no use to you unless you owned a Macintosh computer, and Apple was selling Macintosh computers. So that was the way in which they got paid for writing the software was that it increased the value of the hardware they were selling, which couldn't be copied. Uh, so that's one example. And another example that's, I think, becoming quite common is that if you're a musician, you give away the recordings online of your music, and you charge tickets for people to come to your concerts. And you would think of a variety of other things along those lines. Uh, that I give away a great deal of intellectual property, Right. As you could see if that thing hadn't decided to would be a nuisance. Uh, I wanted to go back to the web page. Uh, I give away quite a lot of intellectual property. I don't get paid for it directly, but I do get invitations to come to pleasant places such as Brazil uh, as an indirect result. So that's a benefit that I'm getting indirectly by giving away the intellectual property. Uh, let me go on to a possibly harder problem, but which is, again, the point I want to make is that the technological progress sometimes makes it difficult or impossible to do something you want to do. And the question to ask is, why do I want to do it? Is there now a better way of achieving that objective? Consider the issue of defamation, slander, and libel. Suppose somebody publishes a damaging lie about me, all right? Uh, claims I'm six feet tall, for example, uh, instead of my nice, efficient five foot three. Uh, if someone publishes a damaging lie, the present solution is that I sue them for slander or for libel, depending on the form of it. In order for that solution to work, if anybody publishes a lie in a form that many people can read, I have to know who did it, and he has to have enough money to be worth suing. That used to be the case, because it used to require a book or a newspaper. It's no longer the case. With essentially no money, you can get a web page or get onto Facebook or G+. 
If you're even moderately clever, you can do it without telling them who you are. And you can then publish all of the libels and slanders you like about anybody you want, and the worst that happens is your account gets shut down. All right. So that means that the legal method of dealing with defamation works very badly. It happens, however, that there has always been an alternative way of dealing with defamation, and that is when people tell lies about you to answer them. And the same technology that makes it hard to prevent people from lying about you makes it easier than it ever used to be to answer people. My standard example, which a few of you may be old enough to remember, was Usenet, which was something uh, on a, a, something on the internet that looked like a huge number of bulletin board systems. And there was a search engine for it. So that meant that if anybody mentioned my name on any one of the bulletin boards in Usenet, I could in 20 or 30 seconds find it, do a search for my name on Usenet, and I could then put a response in the same thread on the same bulletin board answering what somebody said. I think someone in one occasion, uh, maybe on Usenet, I'm not sure, attributed a couple of pages that Murray Rothbard wrote to me. Uh, and I corrected the error. Uh, so, in any case, uh, so I, what you want to think about, and I discuss it in greater length in the book, is how does one make it easier to answer slanders as a better solution than trying to make it practical to sue people who slander you. So that's an example of the same problem. Let me point out another way in which technological change changes the world. And that is that we all look at the world through a whole lot of simplifications. To take the simplest thing, when I look out here, I am not seeing a field with some yellow over there and some gold over there and some black over there and some white over there. I am seeing a man wearing a yellow shirt, a woman wearing a garment part of which is gold, a man with a button on his lapel. I, there's a whole lot of background processing that's converting what actually comes into my eyes into the image my brain has, which makes a whole lot more sense. And such processing always involves simplification. And that's true of our view of the world in general. And there are a number of ways in which the technology means that the simplification doesn't work very well anymore. And let me give you as one simple example. We all take it for granted that everybody has one mother and one father, and that we at least know who the mother is and usually have a pretty good guess who the father is. <laughs> there was a law case in California a few years ago involving a child with five parents. There was a married couple who wanted to have a child. The husband was sterile, and the wife was doubly infertile. She could neither produce a viable egg nor bring a fetus to term. This is why we have markets. They hired a sperm donor, an egg donor, and a host mother, and they produced a baby. Fine, good story. The only trouble was that at about the point when the baby was born, the couple broke up. And then the California courts had to figure out whose baby it was. <laughs> and under a strict reading of the law, the answer was perfectly clear. The mother was the host mother, and the father was her husband. <laughs> because the standard rule in law is that the mother is the woman from whose body the baby was born. And there's a very old common law rule which says that the husband of a woman who has a baby cannot dispute his paternity of that baby uh, unless they were separated when the baby was conceived. The court, I think quite sensibly, rejected the straightforward legal rule and defined parenthood by intention, took the position that the original couple were the legal parents with all of the rights and responsibilities that parenthood gave them. But that's one very small example of the way in which technological change means that the simplifications with which we view the world start breaking down. Let me give you another example, and this one really broke down a little bit a long, long time ago, but it's gotten more and more obvious. And that is that we take it for granted that everybody is either a man or a woman. All right, well, it's never been literally true. If you look at Jewish law, for example, 
which uh, I've been studying because my current book project is a book on legal systems very different from ours. And Jewish law recognizes the existence of two different people who aren't clearly male or female. Hermaphrodites and something called a tum-tum, which seems to be somebody who, for some, due to some deformity, you can't tell until you do surgery, which it is. No, we don't know exactly what it was. But the problem is much greater now. That we now know that although most people either are XX genetically and look like women, or are XY genetically and look like men, but there are a few people who are XX and look like men, or XY and look like women. There are a few people who have genitals of both sorts, that's a you're complete hermaphrodite. There are people who have XX genetics, look like women, and feel in their head as if they're men. And there are people the other way around. So we've got a much more complicated picture, and that makes life harder. It means that we've got a more complicated picture of the world, and there are all sorts of different ways. When I was teaching the seminar this book came out of, one of my students did a paper on the question of, in many different contexts, how do we deal with gender ambiguity? In sports, how do you deal with it? In prisons, how do you deal with it? In marriage law, and divorce law, and so forth and so on. So that's an example. Let me go on to another example. Another assumption that's been, made, been willing to make quite a lot of sense for a long time is that everybody's either alive or dead. Uh, now there are some exceptions in fiction. Uh, undead and zombies and things. But, and, and you could argue that occasionally in a medical context you weren't quite sure whether somebody was dead yet, so wait 10 minutes. Uh, but we've now got a whole new version of the problem. Because there are hundreds of people who we don't really know if they're alive or dead and we won't know 10 years from now. Right? Imagine that you are dying of a currently incurable disease. And you are a technological optimist. You believe that at some point in the future, a cure will be found for your disease. You arrange to have your body frozen, to have the body rapidly lowered to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, taking various precautions to minimize the amount of damage done during this process. And you are enough of a technological optimist to believe that at some point in the future, not only will they be able to cure your disease, which is pretty easy, they will be able to cure the damage done by freezing you. And there are, I think, a couple of hundred people currently who have been cryonically preserved, that's the term for this, and are sitting somewhere waiting for the rest of us to find out if they're alive or dead. Think about some of the issues that it raises. Imagine that the disease you are dying of is a degenerative disease that the longer you wait to be frozen, the less of you will be left. This was a real case, I should say. It was brain cancer. So you don't want to wait until the disease kills you. You want to be frozen right now. And of course, if you are frozen right now, someone just committed murder. And that was, in fact, it didn't happen. They didn't get frozen. But that was a, law, a legal case, again, in California, where somebody attempted to get permission to get frozen. Uh, and the court refused to give that permission. Uh, now you might be able to do it. There are now, in California now has just legalized assisted suicide. So you might be able to do it that way now. But that's one problem with the fact that it's not well defined whether you're alive or dead. Let me give you a different, a different problem. Let us imagine that I am in this situation and I have myself frozen. And my heirs inherit my money. They can't freeze me until I'm legally dead because then it would be a murder. So basically they wait until I've just gotten to the point where I count as legally dead, freeze me very quickly, and hope they can bring me back. My heirs inherit my wealth. My widow remarries. Five years later, there is a news story that they have successfully revived a frozen dog. And humans will not be much later. A few days after that, my wife's second husband and my heirs 
break into the facility where I am stored, smash the container full of liquid nitrogen with the result that my body warms. <laughs> They explain when asked the reason for this vandalism that they could not stand having someone dear to them preserved in a parody of life. What crime have they committed? <coughs> well, they committed vandalism. They violated the property rights of the organization that was storing me. But they haven't committed murder because I was already legally dead. So that suggests one of the ways in which this particular technological development raises issues for a legal system that has to incorporate it uh, in it. That are all relevant to the general issue of privacy. How many people here know what public key encryption is? Yeah, not very many, no reason you should. Encryption means some way of scrambling information such that other people can't read it. And the sort of standard form of encryption, I have a key which is the instruction on how to scramble and unscramble the data. I use the key to scramble a message. I send the message to you. I first arrange for you to have a copy of the key and so you can unscramble the message. And the problem with that for most of us uh, who don't, who aren't governments with, who can send messengers back and forth with guards around them, is if I don't have a safe way of getting a message to you, I may not have a safe way of getting a key to you. And if whoever I'm worried about spying on me intercepted the key, he can now read the messages that I thought were saying. Uh, several decades ago, uh, some mathematicians found a solution to this problem. It's called public key encryption, and it's a mathematical procedure which produces a pair of keys, each of which can decrypt what the other one encrypts, but each of which cannot decrypt what it itself encrypts. So I roll up a pair of keys, I call one of them my private key, and I never give that to anybody. I call the other my public key and I give it to everybody. I want to send you a message. I encrypt uh, the message uh, with, no, you want, sorry, you want to send me a message. You encrypt the message with my public key, you send the message to me, only the matching private key can decrypt it, and only I have that. If somebody else has a copy of my public key, he can send me secret messages too. But he can't read the messages that come to me. If I want to prove that I'm me, suppose I want to communicate with people, and since they're never going to see my face, I want to be able to prove who's communicating with them. Maybe I'm organizing a criminal conspiracy, or uh, starting a revolution, or doing something where identity matters. So I encrypt the message with my private key. I send it to you with a note saying, this is from David Friedman. You decrypt it with my public key, and the fact that it's a message and not gibberish means that it must have been encrypted with the matching private key, which only I have. This is the guts of how digital signatures work. So think about what this means. This means that if you have a fully functional public key infrastructure where everybody has got a private key and a public key and everybody knows everyone else's public key, you have a world of strong privacy. A world where you can interact with people at a distance over the internet. And nobody, however much people are spying on your messages, nobody can read them except the intended recipient. So it's a level of privacy human beings have never had. Uh, Furthermore, it's a technology that lets you simultaneously have anonymity and reputation. I can have reputation because using my digital signature, I can prove that different messages from the same person. So for example, suppose I wanted to sell legal advice. I can't legally sell legal advice because I'm not a member of the bar in California. Suppose, however, I was competent to do it. I set up a web page called Legal Eagle Online. I give away legal advice for six months. People observe it's good legal advice, and I then sell legal advice. Why can I sell legal advice? Because I can prove that the advice you got is from me by using my digital signature. I have the reputation of being a good advisor, and you then pay me for it. All right? So that's a way in which one can evade a wide range of government restrictions by taking advantage of the fact that you cannot control what you cannot see. 
And you can thus have a world in which private interactions are really invisible to everybody except the people who are doing it. Uh, and in some ways, that's a world that libertarians will find very attractive because it's a world where although you still have the possibility of fraud, you don't have the possibility of force. You can't get a bullet through an Ethernet cable. All right, You can't use direct force on people if all you know is how to send the messages. And you can't physically attack people if you don't know who they are. Anonymity, in a sense, is the strongest possible armor. Uh, on the other hand, I've given you one technology that can greatly increase privacy. Unfortunately, there are other technologies in the other direction. One of the things that has developed over the last few decades is the use of video surveillance. You have a light pole and a video camera on it covering some area. And somewhere a policeman is watching the theme. So far, that doesn't sound very dangerous. It just means the policeman can watch indoors out of the rain instead of having to actually be in the park looking around. But combine that technology with two others, face recognition and database technology. Face recognition means that a computer can go over that video and identify who the people are. Database technology means that you could have videos covering all public places and everything that happened in a public place would be findable. All right, zero privacy in public places. Uh, I like to imagine a trial uh, 20 or 30 years from now, and the prosecutor says to the defendant, where were you on 2 o'clock on Friday the 17th? Now the prosecutor is an old guy, so he's a little out of touch. But his assistant sort of taps him on the sort of thing was. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's the video of where you were at 2 p.m. on Friday the 17th. Because everything is recorded and searchable and findable. So far I said in public places. But as the technology goes on, we can expect to end up with video cameras the size and aerodynamic characteristics of mosquitoes, at which point there may not be any private places left. So we have the idea of what David Grin called the transparent society. A society where everything anybody does is observable, searchable, and findable, which is a somewhat scary idea. Uh, suppose we get both. Suppose we get both my world of strong privacy through encryption and Grin's transparent society. So that cyberspace is more private than it ever, anything has ever been before, and real space is less private than anything has ever been before. What does that world look like? And the answer is that it ultimately depends on two things. How much of your life is lived in cyberspace, and how well you can guard the interface between real space and cyberspace. It does no good to encrypt your communications if a video mosquito is watching you type. So you have to think about ways in which you could communicate with the internet which couldn't be observable by a spy. For example, a direct mind to machine link would be one obvious way of doing it. Uh, in any case, my point is only that you have a set of technologies here which cut in opposite directions, towards more privacy and towards less privacy, which is one of the reasons why I regard the future as a very uncertain place. Meanwhile, there are some other interesting technologies which are relevant to the world of strong privacy for doing business online. And one of them is anonymous e-cash. We have known for a couple of decades how to set up a, money, a private money system such that I can make a payment to you by sending you a message. And now, I don't have to know who you are, you don't have to know who I am, and the bank holding the money never knows who either of us is. So that gives you the equivalent of using cash to make payments. And the cash, after all, is an anonymous payment system, but one you can do online. Uh, the reason it doesn't exist is not that we don't know how to do it, it's that in order to have such a system, you need a trusted bank. A trusted bank has to be in a reliable country, and no government in the world wants anonymous e-cash to exist because if anonymous e-cash exists, money laundering laws become unenforceable. It becomes too easy for people to shift money around. Uh, on the other hand, as you may know, there is a private e-cash which 
through a very ingenious process does not require a bank issuing it. It's not an anonymous one. It's called Bitcoin. You've probably all heard of it. It's arguably the least anonymous money that ever existed because if you know how Bitcoin works, every transaction is public to everybody who uses Bitcoin. What's public, however, is an account-to-account -account transaction, so you may be able to conceal what person the account belongs to. Uh, but that's sort of the current cutting edge. Imagine we have my world of strong privacy, and now most of the business people are engaged in online, governments cannot see and cannot affect. So one of the issues is how do you enforce contracts? Since one of the things we expect governments to do is to enforce contracts. And the answer is you have to shift to reputational models rather than court models for enforcement. You need to use ways in which the ability of the internet to share information very well means that you can cheat somebody only once. And after that, everybody who wants to deal with you knows you can't be trusted. And again, I discuss in more detail, both in a published article and in future imperfect, ways in which you can set up to do this. This is really a six hour lecture, and I don't think I can spend six hours, so I've got to skip over some things. Let me go on now to another set of technologies, a very different kind of set. And I want to start with biotechnology. And I want to start with what I think of as the stealth biotechnology, because this is a biotech which is fully developed and deployed, which changes one of the fundamental facts of human life, and no one seems to have noticed. The technology in question is paternity testing. All right? One of the facts of human life, as long as the species has existed, was it is a wise child that knows his father. All right? You know who your mother is, who your child is, is who your father is, is conjecture. And if you think of human mating institutions, human mating institutions are mostly set up to solve that problem. Why do you have institutions in which uh, only the husband can sleep with the wife? Because that way, as long as she doesn't succeed in cheating on him, he knows that her children are his. This is no longer the case. All it takes to know for a child to know his father is a good lamb. And the question is, will mating institutions change? You could imagine a variety of sort of group marriage patterns in which you find out who the father is only when the child shows up. On the other hand, uh, human males are jealous and that may be a reason why they won't accept such an arrangement. Uh, but it's at least worth noting that while sort of nobody noticed, technology has just changed under our feet one of the facts that our institutions are building. Uh, let me give you another <coughs> biotech possibility. And this is one which, a primitive version of which already exists. And we're just going to get stronger and stronger over time. And that's the idea of parents determining what children they have. All right, the current version is that if you do amniocentesis and find out that the fetus you are bearing is going to have Down syndrome, you may avoid it. And there are a couple of slightly more technologically sophisticated versions of that. But what you really want is a way in which a couple can choose among all the children they might have which ones they do have. So they can choose a child who does not carry my lack of musical ability, does not carry the bad heart that killed my father and grandfather, but does carry my good memory for poetry and whatever other virtues I have, and choose the egg that has my wife's musical ability, the skills that let her make sense of a map and actually figure out where she is without paying attention, which I've never learned how to do. Uh, and so forth. And there is actually an old science fiction novel by Robert Heinlein, which has a very ingenious technology that in not too long we should be able to do, which lets you do exactly that, which lets you select separately the sperm and the egg according to which genes they carry. If you think about it, you'll see that the problem is that examining a sperm or an egg is going to damage it. And the trick that occurred to Heinlein is that if you know the process that generates sperm and egg, it takes your full set of genes, splits them in half, and in effect throws away one half and turns the other half into the sperm or the egg. So Heinlein's idea is you have the final stage that produces the egg or the sperm done in vitro, outside of the body. 
you destructively analyze the extra half. You then do a full gene analysis of any cell in your body. That gives you the full set of genes. Subtract the ones that you've thrown away, and you can deduce what's in the other one. And you just do that until you find a sperm that has the desirable genes from the father, an egg that has the desirable genes from the mother. You combine them in vitro, and you're off to producing the perfect baby. All right. It's what I think of as libertarian eugenics, because it's a form of eugenics which doesn't force people not to have babies or to have babies, but just lets them choose which babies they have, which strikes me as a very attractive possibility. Now, it's true, I, by pure good chance, just happen to get the perfect babies, but other people can't rely on that. Uh, let me mention another bit of biotech uh, that is probably going to be more important to you than to me, unfortunately. At the moment, everybody in this room is dying of an incurable disease. It's called old age. <laughs> There is no good reason why it should stay incurable. If you think about it, the information needed to rebuild your body is in every cell of your body. That's a massively redundant source of data. And that means that if only the engineering was good enough, we ought to be able to keep rebuilding your body forever. So that suggests that at some point, and my guess is it won't be soon enough for me, but looking around this room, almost all of you are younger than I am by a good deal, and I think the odds are pretty good for you, that whatever you die of, it won't be old age, that we will have cured that disease by then. And that then starts you thinking about some interesting questions about what kind of life you would live if you expected to live as long as you wanted. Would you decide to work very hard for 50 years accumulate enough money so that you could retire for the next two centuries. <laughs> maybe. Maybe what strikes me a little more attractive is you accumulate enough money so that you can retire on what you see as a minimal tolerable income. And you then take those jobs that you like thereafter. Uh, but you can think of other alternatives. Uh, but it, 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 not all good. Notice that if we had solved this problem a few generations back, Franco would still be in control of Spain, and the collapse of the Soviet Union would have occurred with Joseph Stalin in control of a large number of thermonuclear weapons. Not a pleasant thought. So you can argue that if you end aging, you also have a situation in which the old people stick in power, and that prevents social change. There is the argument people have made that the way science really progresses is not by the old scientists being convinced by the young scientists, but by the old scientists dying off and the young scientists with their new ideas taking over. So it's attractive in some ways, not in others. Let me go on to another technology, uh, and one which is perhaps even more powerful than life extension, indeed, which might give you life extension, and that's nanotechnology. How many people here know what the term nanotechnology means? All right. More than know about encryption, at least. <laughs> the original idea, which started with uh, the physicist Feynman, and was then picked up, picked up by a man called Drexler, whose book you can find on the web. Uh, the idea is that everything humans make is engineered on a very gross scale. That the processing units, the CPU in this machine, every bit of it involves trillions or quadrillions of atoms. We ourselves are engineered on the atomic scale. If you think about how DNA works, or how a protein works, or how uh, various things inside your body work, in effect, we are, our bodies are run by molecular machines, by machinery where the individual machine is, a, in effect, a single molecule. And Drexler's idea is, what if we got to be good enough engineers so we could build stuff like that? So that we could design machines that were atom, 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 atom on that scale to do things. If you can do it, the first big step is to build a general purpose assembler. What's a general purpose assembler? It is a molecular machine for building molecular machines. 
It's a factory. And you have some way of sending it instructions and it'll build things. And if you have one general purpose assembler, what do you think is the first thing you do with it? You have it build a copy of itself. And you have them build copies of themselves. And pretty soon you've got a billion uh, assemblers. And you then send them the instructions to build a car. And you dig a pit in your backyard. Uh, Earth is largely made out of aluminum. And you dump in a few other elements that are needed. And you pour in a little gasoline because it's got to be able to disassemble something for energy. And it follows the instructions and attaches atom to atom to atom to atom. When you come out in the morning, there's your car. Uh, and this sounds impossible, but it is after, way, after all the way an oak tree is built. All right, the oak tree is a molecular machine built into the seed and the vet, which picks up materials that's slower than my process, and it builds something very large and impressive. Uh, so nanotechnology has a lot of interesting possibilities. One of them is very cheap production, because once you've got your general purpose assembler, all you've got to do is to give it atoms. All the atoms are the same. All aluminum atoms are the same. All carbon atoms are the same. So it's just like plugging together little Legos, as it were, to make anything. Furthermore, you can make very small things. Uh, someone has worked out the design for a nanotech red blood cell. All right, what does the red blood cell do? It carries oxygen. A nanotech red blood cell is a very small compressed oxygen tank that functions like a red blood cell, but holds something like 100 times as much oxygen. So you have a reasonable number of these along with the regular red blood cells in your veins. And one day you have a heart attack. You call up the doctor and you make an appointment because you've got several hours of oxygen still in your bloodstream to keep you alive. All right, that's one of the minor things you could do with nanotech. One of the major things you could do with nanotech is to build a cell repair machine. You build a miniature submarine, so miniature it can go into cells. It has instructions on what broken cells look like, and it just goes through your body fixing everything that's wrong. Among other things, that solves the aging problem, because I can assure you aging is something that's wrong. Uh, now, you might say it's going to take a long time, because there are a lot of cells in your body, but that's all right. You build a million cell repair machines, and you swallow them, and they just go through your body continuously fixing things. So now you never die of anything short of a bullet through the head, which they probably can't fix fast enough. Uh, so that's the upside of nanotechnology. But there's a downside of nanotechnology. Uh, and the basic idea is suppose somebody makes a nano device whose only purpose in life is making copies of itself. And it uses some readily available source of power, such as sunlight. And somebody releases it. And in about a, work, a week, it turns the entire surface of the globe into copies of itself. This is what's known in the literature as the gray goo scenario. Because your one thing that got out of your lab has just turned the entire world into gray goo. Uh, so you can see problems as well as advantages. <laughs> And some people have argued that that means that if you have nanotechnology, uh, you need to have some kind of government control to make sure that something like gray goo or some tailored sort of nanotech equivalent of a virus to kill people doesn't get produced. The problem with that is that if you have such regulation, the regulation is done by governments. What are the organizations that spend the largest amount of money on finding ways of killing people? All right, governments, right? That's what defense departments do, or they hire other people to do. So there's a certain element of setting the fox to guard the hen house. And the alternative is to hope that defensive nanotech develops faster than offensive nanotech, and that therefore, although some crazy high school kid in his basement has created a nanotech virus to kill everybody he doesn't like, everybody who doesn't like has got cell repair machines running through their bodies, fixing anything that a virus removes and removing the virus as it happens. Uh, now we've got a little experimental evidence on this, because living creatures after all are nanotech machines, and you might say that you yourself 
are something whose purpose is turning the world into copies of you. We do it rather slowly, and they're imperfect copies, but after all, we're designed by evolution for reproductive success. And so far, the small nano things have not wiped out the large ones. We still have both bacteria and whales around, which suggests that it's not that easy uh, to, to, to destroy things. All right, let me, let me go on to uh, one more, no, two more, I think, technologies. I may be running a little bit longer than I thought, but you seem to be patient. Uh, let me start with the question of what are you and what am I? All right, if you think about my identity, it's not my finger. All right, if I lost the finger, I'm still me. If I lost a foot, I'm still me. What I am, as far as I can tell, my best guess at what I am, is software running on the hardware of my brain. I think that what a conscious being is is essentially a very elaborate natural computer program or a set of programs which are functioning using the brain as its computer. If that guess is right, that then suggests that as we get better and better at building computers and programming them, we can make things more and more like us. We can make artificial intelligence which thinks computer programs that are in some sense people. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's been a fairly important writer in these areas, who's been a computer inventor and entrepreneur for quite a long time, the Kurzweil music machine, the Kurzweil reading machine for the blind and such, his estimate a while ago was that in about 30 years, we will have artificial intelligence at human level of intelligence. Now that is not such a terrible idea. It would be sort of interesting to have a world with a very different kind of people sharing. On the other hand, if computers keep getting faster as fast as they have been, if in 30 years we have human level AI, in 40 years we're gerbils. And we better hope our new masters like keeping pets. Right. So that's something to worry about. Kurzweil's solution to that problem, by the way, is that while we're developing human level AI, we're also developing fast mind to machine links so that we can do more and more of our thinking in silicon instead of carbon. And therefore, when the, computer, when, when the computers become super intelligent, so do we. Now, this isn't a crazy idea. I already do a good deal of my thinking in silicon. Uh, and probably so do you. That's how I keep track of things. It reminds me of things and so forth and so on. But you need a much faster link for his, his idea. Let me go on to uh, another technology, and that's virtual reality. That's the idea of you're, on, you're connected to the internet and you get a full sense experience so that it's an illusion as if you were really somewhere. All right? We can't do that yet. We have VR. Every time you play a computer game, you're engaged in VR. The screen to you is a sheet of glass. On the other side of that is the world you're fighting in or running in or doing whatever you're doing in. Uh, it's likely to get better over time. Uh, the high-tech solution is to crack the dreaming problem, to figure out how it is that our minds create illusions when we dream and then be able to do it synthetically so that you could be attached to a computer and to you, what you're eating tastes like Baskin Robbins ice cream or even better cheese bread, uh, when in fact it's soybean mush, all right? Because after all, taste is only a virtual, uh, sensual experience, not a physical experience. And you could imagine if we do this, a future world where everybody lives in a little cubicle and everybody eats soybean mush, and everybody exercises without knowing it. But in your mind, you live in a mansion on the California coast, you live in a beautiful house, you can travel anywhere you like because you've got a full sense of it. Then you have to decide for yourself whether this is heaven or hell. Uh, it occurred to me when I was thinking about this that in fact, that may not be the ultimate technology that the really high technology is one we've had for a long time, and it's called the human imagination. Because in fact, World of Warcraft is already, in some sense, a full immersive technology, because all you've got is a screen and speakers, but then you've got your imagination. And to you, those are actual people you're interacting with. All right? So we may see what happens 
more and more in the future uh, as you have more and more of that. And again, I have a fairly long discussion in the chapter of the good and bad potentials of ritual uh, Let me go on to what I think is the last of my categories, and that's what I think of as mind drugs. That there are a variety of ways in which drugs can be used to affect the mind. And they are usefully classified in three categories. Performance, pleasure, and control. Alcohol does all three. <laughs> right? Some people find that they are relaxed and can function better after having one drink. That's performance. Some people enjoy, for some bizarre reason I've never understood, the sensation of being drunk. That's pleasure. Some people get other people drunk in order to have some control over them, that's a control. <laughs> We're getting much better at making drugs and much better at understanding how the mind works. So it is likely that in the future we will have better drugs for all three of us. I am told that currently the best apparently safe performance drug is Motifil. I've never tried it myself. I'd have to get a prescription, which would be something of a nuisance. But Motifinil is a drug which is best known, I think, as a way of staying up, uh, functioning without sleep for long periods of time. But the military uses it for that. But apparently it also gives you more concentration. Uh, and for that matter, Ritalin, which is prescribed for ADHD, it turns out that you can't find out if someone has ADHD by giving him Ritalin. Because if you don't have ADHD, it improves your concentration too. So that it's basically an improving concentration drug, and I gather it's used illegally by people taking exams and such for that purpose. So we are likely to have better and better performance drugs, and then we may want to think about what problems those do or don't, don't raise. Pleasure drugs is pretty obvious, alcohol, marijuana, heroin, and so forth. Uh, and again, in some sense, it's a good thing. You can get pleasure as long as you don't get so much pleasure that you never do anything else. Uh, the And control drugs, that's probably the scariest one, because you could imagine, for example, that somebody develops a credulity drug. It's a drug that you feed something and they then believe what you tell them. And if we have things like credulity drugs, we may want a legal system where no contract is valid unless you had a blood test when you were signing it to make sure that you weren't under the influence of someone else's credulity. Uh, so, again, I discussed this stuff at much greater length in the book. You can read the book for free from, from there. You can read a variety of other things of mine from there. You can even look at the evidence of a successful breeding program. It only took three generations to breed musical ability back into my father's descendants. <laughs> and I've got the recording of my grandchildren singing Happy Birthday to prove it. Uh, that's what that link goes to. Uh, but let me give you some sort of summary conclusions. The first is that the world is likely to change quite fast. That I mostly limited myself as a book to about 30 or 40 years into the future on the grounds that by the time you get that far, one or another of the technologies may have changed the world enough that I can't see anything very useful about it. All right. One of the reasons that I don't take most of the global warming stuff seriously is that it's worrying about things happening 100 years in the future. And I don't think we have any serious idea what's going to be happening 100 years in the future. Uh, the future, I think, is radically uncertain. Uh, global warming strikes me as a pretty wimpy catastrophe that despite all of the talk, you're really talking about a sea level rise by the end of the century, about two feet. That's a fraction of the distance between high tide and low tide. You're talking about moving coastlines by a few hundred feet, invisible on a map, changing temperature by a few degrees centigrade. On the other hand, as you may have figured out from what I've said, I have three different technologies that can wipe out the human race faster than that. that Nanotechnology by Grey Goo or by somebody creating a really effective nanotech virus. Biotechnology by some... I don't know if it's occurred to you, but diseases are not intentional. Diseases are an accident. A disease is a parasite. 
and a parasite doesn't want to kill its host. All right? A disease that just makes you sick, ideally makes you sneeze, which spreads it, is much more successful than a disease that kills you. So lethal diseases are accidents. A lethal disease is typically a disease that either has just jumped from one species to another and hasn't adapted to not kill the host, or has just jumped from a human population that's resistant to a human population that is resistant. With biotech, we can do much better than that. With biotech, you can design diseases that were designed to kill. So that's my second way of wiping out the human race. And of course, the third way is artificial intelligence. That if we end up with computers that are a great deal smarter than we are, they might be nice. They might think that, you know, as their creators, we deserve to be carefully preserved and, you know, have our hands held and things. Or they might decide that we're sort of a nuisance and that life will be tidier without us. So those are three things which seem to me much more dangerous than overpopulation, global warming, the popular kinds of, of concerns. Uh, let me make a general, a general prop point. The question is, how can technology make us worse off? And your one's first instinct ought to be it can't. Because what does technological improvement do? It lets us do more of what we want to do. It sounds good. On the other hand, all human societies face a problem, which the economists call the coordination problem. How do you get millions of people to somehow coordinate their activities in order to do things? When you think about the number of people it takes to make a pencil. That's an old example. In order to make a pencil, you need wood. In order to have wood, you need to cut down trees. In order to cut down trees, you need chainsaws. In order to have chainsaws, you need steel and gasoline and rubber and various other things. In order to have steel, you need iron and coal and various other things. If you run it through, an ordinary pencil is the product of millions of people coordinating. How do you get them to coordinate? And there are only two answers to that problem, and one of them doesn't work. The one that doesn't work is centralized authority. Having somebody at the top saying, you do this, you do that, you do that. That works for small groups. It works for a football team. It doesn't work for 200 million people, for reasons which maybe were obvious when the Soviet Union collapsed. The method that does work is a decentralized system where each person controls a tiny bit of the world, himself and his property, and where people interact by exchange, by prices, by a signaling method, such that if there isn't enough steel being produced to make the uh, chainsaws, the price of steel goes up, and that makes even produce more steels, steel, and similarly with everything else. But in order for that method to work, you have to be able to divide up the world in such a way that what I do on my point part doesn't have much effect on other people. So you can say, well, I control my stuff, you control your stuff, we can trade if we like. But any time where what I do on my property has a small effect on 100 million people, we have something which we have no good way of controlling. Global warming would be an example of that. You can think of many other examples. One possible effect of technological change is that as we become more powerful, the things we do on our territory are bigger and bigger range, at which point it becomes harder and harder to define property rights in a way such that you can coordinate, such that my actions don't affect you, and therefore we can handle everything by trade and, and property rights and such. So it's possible that technological change could reduce us from one solution to zero solutions, and that would be very unfortunate. So that's sort of, I think, the short, short version. Uh, then it's a good deal easier to use property rights to deal with bows and arrows than it is with atomic bombs. Uh, think about the logic of that. Uh, when I test my bow and arrow, as long as I make sure I've got a good backstop, there's much, not much danger to anybody else. Uh, on the other hand, technological change also makes it easier to trade with people, easier to communicate, easier to bargain. It makes it easier to observe things, to monitor things, to know whether I'm affecting you. So it's not like it goes in only one direction. The point I want to make is only that technological progress is neither your friend nor your enemy. It's simply the background of the world you're going to have to live in. And we don't have any choice about that. All right, I think that's basically what I said. Welcome to an interesting century.